During the closing years of the Vietnam conflict, the United States Air Force introduced a number of unique and highly specialized weapon systems which were eminently suitable to the Southeast Asian environment. Now, this film report describes in general terms what these systems are, shows how and why they were used, and explains why they represent a giant step forward. To work these new systems into the existing pattern of conventional weaponry required long and persistent effort, and it required a dedicated team spirit from the men involved, the air crews who delivered these weapons on target, the specialists responsible for the complex electronics, and the ground crews who worked night and day to keep the aircraft target bound. From the start of its combat operations in Southeast Asia, the U.S. Air Force was faced with a number of adverse conditions, including a rainforest jungle environment, inclement weather conditions which could change from bad to worse within an hour, or even minutes. And besides these natural obstacles, the enemy made an all-out effort to impose restrictions of his own. The weapons we had were not very effective for precision bombing in such a combat environment. For ground targets, our munitions were primarily general purpose bombs that didn't give us the required accuracy. Well, for example, from 1965 through 1968, we flew more than 600 sorties over the Than Hoa Bridge in North Vietnam, hammering at it with every type of conventional ordnance. During this period, the bridge never ceased operations, and we lost 10 aircraft in the process. Another early and frustrating example was the traffic on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Though attacked almost constantly by our aircraft for years, we were never able to haul it. Enemy work crews quickly repaired road damage, and the traffic continued at night without much delay. Obviously, conventional weapons and tactics had not solved our problems. We needed unconventional systems, specialized ordnance, and ingenious modes of delivery. One step in this direction came in 1968, when the AC-130A side-firing gunship made its debut. The latest gunship, the AC-130H, might be described as a combined flying avionics laboratory and airborne gun platform. Its computer-directed weapon array has three types of side-firing guns, including, for the first time, a 105-millimeter howitzer, and the aircraft is loaded with electronic sensors for night work. It has proved to be a highly versatile weapon system used on a wide variety of missions, including armed reconnaissance and interdiction, air support for friendly troops in contact with enemy forces, night patrols in defense of the Saigon military district, and target marking and lighting to aid ground and air attacks. It is also well suited for supporting search and rescue operations. The job has been called on to perform on several occasions. The gunship concept has its limitations. Well, they are somewhat vulnerable to ground fire and generally avoid high threat areas. But thanks to the men who flew and maintained them, they've scored an impressive record of target destruction. From November of 1971 through March of 72, they destroyed over 3,300 trucks and damaged some 5,000 others. In a five-month wet season period, they destroyed 1,532 trucks, 55 armored vehicles, and 382 boats during armed reconnaissance missions. In its close air support rule, Army advisors on the scene at Ann Lock credit the gunships with being the single most effective weapon system used in defense of that city. Though the gunships immediately began solving a part of our unique environmental problems, more was needed. We had to find and pinpoint targets for our fighter bombers with greater accuracy, particularly so at night when enemy activity was greatest. Now, these needs spurred a number of radically new developments, including Loran computerized navigational systems and laser ranging and designating techniques. 
One of these developments was the OV-10 paved nail forward air control aircraft, equipped with low light level scopes, onboard computers and lasers to pinpoint the targets. At night, the weapon system officer works from the rear seat. Using the scope, which intensifies light some 95,000 times, he finds the target and shines the laser on it. The reflected laser pulse is processed by the computer for precise target location. Then, the pilot calls for fighter aircraft to come in and take out the target. The system is adapted to daylight usage as well as night, but even more fruitful was the concept of using the laser principle to guide the bomb itself directly to the target. Laser guidance and electro-optical guidance arrived at about the same time, giving a new meaning to the term precision bombing. Our standard iron bombs ranging from 500 to 3,000 pounds could now be fitted with electronic eyes. It was a massive job to move this technology from the drawing board to the combat environment of Southeast Asia. But even our overworked ordnance crews, who now had to fit and calibrate guidance kits on each bomb for laser missions, would agree that the results were worth it. The principle is simple enough. An aircraft equipped with a laser illuminator approaches the target and directs the beam on it. The bomb is then delivered, with its detector picking up the reflected laser energy from the target below. It continually corrects its course all the way down, homing in on the target. In the attacking flight, one aircraft can carry the laser designator for all to use. Originally, the F-4 Illuminator aircraft, without bombs of its own, carried a laser designator mounted in the rear cockpit. The latest F-4 version uses a pod-mounted TV camera, four-sided with a laser designator. This allows the Illuminator aircraft to carry its own bomb load, lasering the target for itself and for the follow-on aircraft. One notable limitation is ground visibility. Generally speaking, if the pilot can see the target, he can illuminate it with a laser beam. But laser energy will not penetrate clouds, rain, smoke, or haze. Thus, the always uncertain Vietnam weather often befriended the enemy, negating to some extent the lethal accuracy of laser attacks. In clear weather, the enemy would try to obscure the target with smoke generators, and rain or shine, he used camouflage techniques ingeniously. Nevertheless, laser bomb attacks soon began piling up impressive scores against targets in the extremely high threat environment of North Vietnam. The results, documented by post-strike reconnaissance photos, speak for themselves. Another innovation, introduced at the same time as laser-guided weapons, was the electro-optical guidance concept. Now, these are air-to-ground glide bombs with a self-contained television guidance system. The weapon can be locked onto a target and released at distances greater than those of standard ballistic bombs. Once released, no further air crew control is needed, and the pilot can take immediate evasive action. This greatly reduces the risk of an enemy hit. The television eye has two notable limitations, both involving ground visibility. First, the system is generally ineffective against targets that blend in with their surroundings. So the target area must stand out clearly, providing some light contrast for guidance. Second, like laser-oriented weaponry, the electro-optical system will not penetrate clouds, dust, smoke, or haze. However, the system has been very successfully employed against such targets as airfield installations, bridges, and clearly defined jungle trail areas, targets which can be visually spotted before video acquisition. Weather could stop our precision bombing with guided weapons, but not our attacks with conventional bombs on larger area targets. These raids with conventional ordnance use the Loran navigational system to reach non-visible target areas. Digital computers installed in F-4 aircraft form the brains of the Loran system. The computers collect navigational data from a chain of ground transmitters, providing the air crews with a continuous present position of their aircraft from takeoff to target to landing. Thus, when visibility is poor, Loran provides an automatic locating of targets with a precision sufficient for unguided ordnance attacks. 
The Loran system also provides forward air controllers with armed reconnaissance and night attack capabilities. The pilot who flew these F-4 fastback missions played an important, often dangerous role. He ventured into high threat areas, looked for targets, and if the enemy reacted, he would call in airstrikes on the self-revealed area. He had to know the rules of engagement code to validate each target he found as legal for attack. It's no exaggeration to say that the back pilot was the eyes and brain of the strike flights in his area. An airstrike with any type of ordnance demands intense concentration by the aircrew on the target. Now, they must not be distracted by the need to defend themselves against MIG attacks or ground-to-air missiles. Thus, all strikes against heavily defended areas required considerable air support. The protective forces included Iron Hand hunter-killer teams, MIG cap and MIG escort forces, electronic suppression aircraft, and chaff dispenser aircraft. MIG cap and MIG escort missions were the variations on the same theme to maintain our air superiority, challenging any MIG fighters that might threaten our strike force. There's a world of deadly meaning in that impersonal term, air superiority. It is hand-to-hand -hand combat translated into the sky. Courage, daring, and enormous skill are the hallmarks of the fighter crew. Their weapons were cannon and missiles. One was the heat-seeking sidewalk, which can be lethal at ranges of less than two miles and can be fired from any position in the rear hemisphere of the target. It has been successfully employed during high-G dogfights. The Sparrow is a supersonic all-weather radar missile that can be launched from any aspect angle, from head-on to stern. Head-on firings can be from 13 miles range, stern launches as little as 1,500 feet. This missile uses the principle of illuminating the target with continuous wave energy until missile impact. The nose cannon has two selectable rates of fire, 4,000 rounds per minute or 6,000. In combat, the F-4 tries to fire from a close-in, low-angle off position. Its cannon concentrates a very large amount of high-explosive incendiary in a small area of the sky with very deadly effect. In the final months of combat, we introduced the slotted wing F-4E. Now, this version came closer to matching the MiG's tight turn capability and gave us a better chance to get in firing position. We had developed by this time an improved lead computing gun sight, TISIO, and an air-to-air -air weapons panel, among other items of hardware, to aid the pilot in getting his MiG kill. TISIO is a powerful TV camera for identifying aircraft visually at distances of 20 miles plus. An electronic identification system also helps separate friendlies from enemies at extreme distances. The air-to-air -air weapons panel provides for rapid changes in attack mode during a fluid combat situation. At the close of North Vietnam hostilities, the U.S. Air Force had a good lead in air superiority. In 1972, one wing destroyed 32 MiGs. 22 with radar homing missiles, 7 with the heat seekers, and 3 with the nose gun. SAM sites, with their radar tracking facilities, posed one of the biggest threats to our strike forces over the north. It was originally met by F-105s carrying sophisticated radar detecting gear, plus strike anti-radiation missiles. Success was limited to brief interruptions of the enemy's radar until the F-105 was given an improved missile and was teamed with an attack F-4. This partnership was named the Hunter-Killer Team. A full team consisted of two F-105Gs and two F-4Es, the former to detect and suppress the SAM radar, the latter to attack the site itself when visually spotted. Though SAM launches usually leave large clouds of dust and smoke, they can be difficult to detect, especially in haze or when camouflaged. The new generation of anti-radiation missiles have improved frequency coverage and two different attack modes, thus expanding their usefulness from SAMs to all types of radar. It can be launched at ranges greater than the SAM. In fact, maximum range for a straight-ahead shot is over 50 miles. At the target, they detonate a white smoke marker, with the killer F-4s then rolling in and delivering canisters of CBU on the site. This strongly motivates the enemy to forego SAM launchings 
when the hunter-killer team is in his area. In addition to these tactics, we used electronic jamming techniques provided by EB-66 aircraft orbiting at a standoff distance. One electronics countermeasure deserving mention is CHAF, composed of strips of aluminum foil. By obscuring airborne targets on enemy radar scopes, CHAF makes accurate aircraft tracking difficult. CHAF dispensing aircraft can create a wide protective corridor. However, while dispensing, the aircraft must fly a relatively straight and level course. In this position, they are vulnerable to MiG attacks and must be closely escorted by other fighter aircraft. Now, one of the most significant trends in military aviation is the development of avionics. Excellent examples of this progress are the F-111 aircraft. The A-7D aircraft, with their sophisticated navigation and weapons delivery systems. The A-7D is a light attack aircraft designed to provide exceptional accuracy with minimum pilot workload. The brain of the system is the digital computer, which receives inputs from the inertial navigation set, forward-looking radar, and the Doppler radar. A projected map display augments the Doppler radar scope during low-level flight. The primary visual equipment is the head-up display screen, or HUD. In navigation, the computer provides steering commands on the HUD, supplying all the information needed for instrument flight. In visual flight conditions, it allows the pilot to observe the real world while simultaneously receiving essential data and steering commands. The aircraft carries an assortment of rockets, air-to-ground missiles, a 20-millimeter nose gun, and Sidewinder missiles for air-to-air -air self defense. Still another asset is long flight endurance provided by the fan engine. A-7Ds normally fly a 400-mile combat radius with 30 minutes in the target area. With this combination of unique features, the A-7D has flown a multitude of combat missions, including close air support, light and heavy interdiction, and helicopter escort. The A-7 is now our primary escort for search and rescue, replacing the A-1. A-7s have also flown linebacker missions over Hanoi. But among the most sophisticated weapon systems used in Southeast Asia was the high-speed, low-level penetrating F-111, which brought around-the-clock air war into the North Vietnam heartland. The F-111s could penetrate the high-threat areas without tankers or other air support thus greatly enhancing the element of surprise. The primary tactic was to deliver high drag bombs at altitudes below 500 feet. This was accomplished by high speed ingress through the mountains of Laos and North Vietnam using the aircraft's terrain following radar for altitude control. The automatic terrain following system uses forward and downward looking radar inputs coupled with airspeed and altitude data to generate steering commands. Altitude settings range from 200 to 1,000 feet, and the steering commands are tied into the autopilot, freeing the crew for navigation, bombing, and system monitoring. The navigation system is synchronized with a ballistics computer, providing automatic weapons release without visual acquisition of the target. With this day-night all-weather capability, the F-111 was well suited for pathfinding other aircraft to enemy troop concentrations, truck parks, storage depots, and similar area targets. The versatility of the F-111 with its long-range capability and advanced avionics package made it a valuable asset in Southeast Asia. The weather in Vietnam was one of the enemy's greatest allies. It was a forecaster's nightmare, changing quickly and constantly and forcing us to adapt weapons and strategy to the latest weather report. The answer was to be ready two ways. We kept a strike force armed with laser ordnance ready to go when the skies were clear, and another force armed with conventional bombs if clouds obscured the target. Now this reduced last minute workload to a minimum and gave us the flexibility we needed. In the later days of our operations, we often sent both conventional and laser guided ordnance on combined missions. Thus, if target weather worsened en route, we could still stage an effective attack. Any evaluation of these specialized weapons shows remarkable results. Well, for example, 
Remember that bridge in North Vietnam we mentioned at the start of this report? Well, that Than Hoa Bridge, which had withstood years of conventional weapons attack, was wrecked by 11 aircraft, which did in one day what 600 aircraft could not accomplish in three years. And they did the job without receiving a single scratch from the heavy bridge defenses. The Paul Doomer Bridge in Hanoi had been temporarily damaged on several occasions during a four-year period. But each success took several days to accomplish, and our losses were high. 16 F-4s loaded with laser-guided bombs took out 1,000 feet of this bridge in one day. 130 SAMs were fired at them, but none were hit. 41 MiGs also attacked the force that day, and U.S. fighters downed 10 of them. The Langia Railway Bridge is a very long structure, vital to the North Vietnam-China supply line. On a single day in June 1972, 24 F-4s armed with laser bombs and flying in marginal weather against the heaviest of enemy defenses destroyed six of the bridge's 11 spans. A prime example of surgical accuracy is the Lang Chi hydroelectric plant, which provided one-third of North Vietnam's power capacity. The turbine building was attacked by eight aircraft, carrying a total of 15 guided bombs. The crews were under orders to avoid hitting the dam itself, which was adjacent to the plant. Thirteen bombs were placed inside the turbine building, while the other two bombs missed by a mere 100 feet. The dam remained unharmed. Storage areas, airfields, POL facilities, barges, SAM sites, tanks, trucks, and many other targets were destroyed in the linebacker offensive. But listing all these numerous successes would only belabor the point. During four years of laser guidance development, we dropped over 16,000 guided bombs. 84% impacted within 100 feet of the target. 50% were direct hits. Looking back, we might say that for this unique war, we had to develop specialized weapon systems. As for the special kind of men required, they were always there. They were the gunship volunteers who inched themselves out of the aft cargo door into the airstream to watch for enemy missiles in AAA. They were the slow fact pilots in their spools, stovepipe operators, who scored heavily with their laserized TV scopes on day-night missions. They were the crews of the laser designator aircraft. The MiG cap and escort pilots who flew their F-4s night and day into high threat areas teaming up to guard the strike force. The F-105 anti-radar crews, whose skill with radar suppression techniques lent invaluable aid to the strike missions. The F-4 fastbacks, who flew alone, spotting and marking targets. The F-111 air crews, whose low-level missions made the nights unsafe for the enemy. They were indeed special men, in the air and on the ground whose combat teamwork developed and perfected both the unique electronic guided ordnance and the new tactics needed for successful delivery. Ingenuity, dedication, and courage. Carrying on our country's long tradition of military achievement. That's what the specialized weapons effort was all about. For after all, weapons, aircraft, and tactics mean nothing in themselves. It's always men who make them work. And in Southeast Asia, they did. <laughs>